Story two of Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, ten Christmas stories by Edward Everett Hale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story two Christmas Waits in Boston, part two. Lycidas and I both thought, as we went into these modest houses to leave the children, to say they had been good, and to wish a merry Christmas ourselves to fathers, mothers, and to guardian aunts, that the welcome of those homes was perhaps the best part of it all. Here was the great stout sailor-boy whom we had not seen since he came back from sea. He was a mere child when he left our school years on years ago, for the East, on board Perry's vessel, and had been round the world. Here was brave Mrs. Mazury. I had not seen her since her mother died. Indeed, Mr. Ingham, I got so used to watching then that I cannot sleep well yet a night. I wish you knew some poor creature that wanted me to-night, if it were only in memory of Bethlehem. You take a great deal of trouble for the children, said Campbell, as he crushed my hand in his, but you know they love you, and you know I would do as much for you and yours which I knew was true. "'What can I send to your children?' said Dalton, who was finishing sword-blades. Ill wind was Fort Sumter, but it blew good to poor Dalton, whom it set up in the world with his sword-factory. "'Here's an old-fashioned tape-measure for the girl, and a Sheffield wimble for the boy.' "'What? There is no boy? Let one of the girls have it, then. It will count one more present for her.' and so he pressed his brown paper parcel into my hand. From every house, though it were the humblest, a word of love, as sweet in truth, as if we could have heard the voice of angels singing in the sky. I bade Harry good night, took Lycidas to his lodgings, and gave his wife my Christmas wishes and good night, and, coming down to the sleigh again, gave way to the feeling which I think you will all understand, that this was not the time to stop but just the time to begin, for the streets were stiller now, and the moon brighter than ever, if possible, and the blessings of these simple people, and of the grand people, and of the very angels in heaven, who are not bound to the misery of using words when they have anything worth saying, all these wishes and blessings were round me, all the purity of the still winter night, and I didn't want to lose it all by going to bed to sleep. So I put the boys all together, where they could chatter, took one more brisk turn on the two avenues, and then, passing through Charles Street, I believe I was even thinking of Cambridge. I noticed the lights in Whittle's house, and, seeing they were up, thought I would make Fanny a midnight call. She came to the door herself. I asked if she were waiting for Santa Claus, but saw in a moment that I must not joke with her. She said she had hoped I was her husband in a minute was one of these contrasts which make life life. God puts us into the world that we may try them and be tried by them. Poor Fanny's mother had been blocked up on the Springfield train as she was coming on to Christmas. The old lady had been chilled through and was here in bed now with pneumonia. Both Fanny's children had been ailing when she came, and this morning the doctor had pronounced it scarlet fever. Fanny had not undressed herself since Monday, nor slept, I thought, in the same time. So while we had been singing carols and wishing Merry Christmas, the poor child had been waiting, and hoping that her husband, or Edward, both of whom were on the tramp, would find for her and bring to her the model nurse, who had not yet appeared. But at midnight this unknown sister had not arrived, nor had either of the men returned. When I rang, Fanny had hoped I was one of them. Professional paragons, dear reader, are shy of scarlet fever. I told the poor child that it was better as it was. I wrote a line for Sam Perry to take to his aunt, Mrs. Mazury, in which I simply said, Dear Mamma, I have found the poor creature who wants you to-night. Come back in this carriage. I bade him take a hack at Barnard's, where they were all waiting up for the assembly to be done at Papanti's. 
I sent him over to Albany Street, and really, as I sat there trying to soothe Fanny, it seemed to me less time than it has taken me to dictate this little story about her, before Mrs. Majory rang gently, and I left them, having made Fanny promise that she would consecrate the day, which at that moment was born, by trusting God, by going to bed, and going to sleep, knowing that her children were in much better hands than hers. As I passed out of the hall, the gaslight fell on a print of Correggio's adoration, where Woodall had himself written years before, Ut appareat iis qui in tenebris et umbri mortis positi sunt. Darkness and the shadow of death, indeed, and what light, like the light and comfort, such a woman as my Mary Majorie brings. And so, but for one of the accidents, as we call them, I should have dropped the boys at the corner of Dover Street and gone home with my Christmas lesson. But it happened, as we irreverently say, it happened as we crossed Park Square, so called from its being an irregular pentagon of which one of the sides has been taken away, that I recognized a tall man, plodding across in the snow, head down, round-shouldered, stooping forward in walking, with his right shoulder higher than his left, and by these tokens I knew Tom Coram, prince among Boston princes. Not Thomas Coram that built the Foundling Hospital, though he was of Boston too, but he was longer ago. You must look for him in Addison's contribution to a supplement to the spectator, the old spectator, I mean, not the Thursday spectator, which is more recent. Not Thomas Coram, I say, but Tom Coram, who would build a hospital to-morrow, if you showed him the need, without waiting to die first, and always helps forward, as a prince should, whatever is princely, be it a statue at home, a school at Richmond, a newspaper in Florida, a church in Exeter, a steam line in Liverpool, or a widow who wants a hundred dollars. I wished him a Merry Christmas, and Mr. Howland, by a fine instinct, drew up the horses as I spoke. Coram shook hands, and as it seldom happens that I have an empty carriage while he is on foot, I asked him if I might not see him home. He was glad to get in. We wrapped him up with spoils of the bear, the fox, and the bison, turned the horses' heads again, five hours now since they started on this entangled errand of theirs, and gave him his ride. "'I was thinking of you at the moment,' said Coram, "'thinking of old college times, of the mystery of language as unfolded by the Abbe Faria to Edmond Dantes in the depths of the Chateau d'If. I was wondering if you could teach me Japanese, if I asked you to a Christmas dinner.' I laughed. Japan was really a novelty then, and I asked him since when he had been in correspondence with the sealed country. It seemed that their house at Shanghai had just sent across there their agents for establishing the first house in Idomo in Japan under the new treaty. Everything looked promising, and the beginnings were made for the branch which has since become Dot and Trevelyan there. Of this he had the first tidings in his letters by the mail of that afternoon. John Coram, his brother, had written to him, and had said that he enclosed for his amusement the Japanese bill of particulars, as it had been drawn out, on which they had founded their orders for the first assorted cargo ever to be sent from America to Idomo. Bill of particulars there was, stretching down the long tissue paper in exquisite geography. But by some freak of the total depravity of things, the translated order for the assorted cargo was not there. John Coram, in his care to fold up the Japanese writing nicely, had left on his own desk at Shanghai the more intelligible English. And so I must wait, said Tom philosophically, till the next East India mail for my orders, certain that seven English houses have had less enthusiastic and philological correspondence than my brother. I said I did not see that, that I could not teach him to speak the Taglian dialects so well that he could read them with facility before Saturday, 
but I could do a good deal better. Did he remember writing a note to old Jack Percival for me five years ago? No, he remembered no such thing. He knew Jack Percival, but never wrote a note to him in his life. Did he remember giving me fifty dollars, because I had taken a delicate boy, whom I was going to send to sea, and I was not quite satisfied with the government outfit? No, he did not remember that, which was not strange, for that was a thing he was doing every day. Well, I don't care how much you remember, but the boy about whom you wrote to Jack Percival, for whose mother's ease of mind you provided the half-hundred, is back again, strong, straight, and well. What is more to the point, he had the whole charge of Perry's commissariat on shore at Yokohama, was honorably discharged out there, reads Japanese better than you read English, and if it will help you at all, he shall be here at your house at breakfast. For, as I spoke, we stopped at Coram's door. Ingham, said Coram, if you were not a parson, I should say you were romancing. My child, said I, I sometimes write a parable for the Atlantic, but the words of my lips are verity, as all those of the Sandemanians. Go to bed, do not even dream of the Taglian dialects. Be sure that the Japanese interpreter will breakfast with you, and the next time you are in a scrape, send for the nearest minister. George, tell your brother Ezra that Mr. Coram wishes him to breakfast here tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. Don't forget the number, Pemberton Square, you know. Yes, sir, said George, and Thomas Coram laughed, said Merry Christmas, and we parted. It was time we were all in bed, especially these boys. But glad enough am I, as I write these words, that the meeting of Coram set us back that dropped stitch in our night's journey. There was one more delay. We were sweeping by the old state house, the boys singing again, Carol, Carol, Christians, as we dashed along the still streets, when I caught sight of Adam's Todd, and he recognized me. He had heard us singing when we were at the advertiser office. Todd is an old fellow apprentice of mine, and he is now, or rather was that night, chief pressman at the Argus office. I like the Argus people. It was there that I was South American editor, now many years ago, and they befriend me to this hour. Todd hailed me, and once more I stopped. What sent you out from your warm steam boiler? Steam boiler, indeed, said Todd. Two rivets loose, steam room full of steam, police frightened, neighborhood in a row, and we had to put out the fire. She would have run a week without hurting a fly, only a little puff in the street sometimes. But there we are, Ingham. We shall lose the early mail as it stands. Seventy-eight tokens to be worked now. They always talked largely of their edition at the Argus. Saw it with many eyes, perhaps, but this time, I am sure, Todd spoke true. I caught his idea at once. In younger and more muscular times, Todd and I had worked the Adams press by that flywheel for full five minutes at a time as a test of strength, and in my mind's eye I saw that he was printing his paper at this moment with relays of grinding stevedores. He said it was so. But think of it to-night, said he, it is Christmas Eve, and not an Irishman to be hired, though one paid him ingots. Not a man can stand the grind ten minutes. I knew that very well from old experience, and I thanked him inwardly for not saying the demnition grind with Mantellini. We cannot run the press half the time, said he, and the men we have are giving out now. We shall lose all our carrier delivery. Todd, said I, is this a night to be talking of ingots, or hiring, or losing, or gaining? When will you learn that love rules the court, the camp, and the Argus office? And I wrote on the back of a letter to Campbell. Come to Argus office, number two, Dasset's Alley, with seven men not afraid to work. And I gave it to John and Sam, bade Howland take the boys to Campbell's house, walked down with Todd to his office, challenged him to take five minutes at the wheel in memory of old times, 
made the tired relays laugh as they saw us take hold, and then, when I had cooled off and put on my cardigan, met Campbell with his seven sons of Anak, tumbling down the stairs, wondering what round of mercy the parson had found for them this time. I started home, knowing I should now have my Argus with my coffee. End of Story 2 Part 2